Pascal only partly in team, but uh, okay. So this paper is about uh, uh, estimating basically the same information that we have from dividend strips by using basically just the cross-section of equities. And it's a paper with uh, Brian Kelly and Sergey Kozak. So let me start with a bit of a motivation. Um, so there's many reasons why we are interested in the infrastructure of discount rates. So, you know, basically how, uh, especially for risky assets, okay, there's, of course, there's a very long history of trying to understand the, the infrastructure of, this, of discount rates and, 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 and yields on risk-free assets. Uh, but there's been a, a, a kind of a more recent literature trying to understand uh, the, uh, you know, how basically how investors uh, perceive and discount uh, cash flows at different horizons, risky cash flow at different horizons. And there's many applications for, there's many reasons why we're interested in this, okay? So first, in a kind of a very direct way, uh, if I am trying to price or, you know, or to value a particular stream of cash flows, whichever particular uh, horizon kind of characterization, uh, I, or specific maturity, uh, I would like to know how each individual cash flow that occurs at different maturities should be discounted to today. Okay, or how investors perceive the riskiness at different maturity. That's important for evaluating investment opportunities. There's also another reason why we're interested in that is because many of our asset pricing models actually turn out to have very strong implications about how this term structure should look like. Okay, so if you think about the, for example, among many models, the longer risk model, the longer risk model is basically you know, inherently about really the dynamics of consumption and it's inherently about the dynamics of risk. And so it's kind of, as we know, these, these kind of models have very strong implications about how investors should perceive, you know, short-term cash flow risks versus long-term cash flow risks. And so looking at these transactions is, uh, is particularly interesting. And then finally, uh, there are, you know, there are, there, there are direct implications in, 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 you know, there's kind of specific application where I think this is particularly important. And one of these has become kind of more relevant uh, and there's been more attention to this recently is, uh, for example, climate change investments, okay? Why? Because these are investments that have a very, very specific term structure uh, of, of, of cost and benefits, in particular, they have very long maturities. And so we are, you know, when we think about climate change mitigation and the thinking about where we want to, you know, um, invest in different projects, we want to understand how we perceive, how investors perceive, how agents perceive long-term cash flows, okay? So these are just different reasons why we might be interested in understanding better return structure of these countries for risky assets. And I want to kind of, before I, I tell you what I do, I want to just review basically the two main approaches that the people have been using to think about this problem, okay? So, and especially from the, uh, from the empirical point of view. So one idea we actually came first is, was pioneer in the early 2000s was, okay, maybe we can learn about these, you know, these different perception of risk across horizons because by looking just at equities or, you know, other kind of uh, traded securities, uh, simply, uh, basically, by extracting uh, these these countries from this from the price of these securities and their cash flows, and exploiting the fact that different securities are differentially exposed to risk at different times. So, very simply, if you have some securities which are very exposed to long-term shocks, and some securities are more exposed to short-term shocks, then you know by comparing basically the pricing and the expected returns of these securities, you can try to learn whether investors are more afraid about, let's say, for example, short-term risks or long-term risks. So you can kind of back out the implied structure of this country. Now, there's many papers that have worked on this in different ways. Like Time Vector has this kind of a fine approach and, you know, there's papers on longer risk that have used a more kind of a structural approach. But what's common about these papers is that they've all been kind of pretty restricted. Okay, so, you know, these are papers that are, they are, they are, they are they're developed out of very simple, pretty constrained models. And so they give us a lot of intuition, but you know, there's a gap between what these papers can generate and the data. The data is very, very rich, and these models tend to be uh, pretty simple and pretty restric restricted. So that was one strand of the literature. And then a more recent strand of literature said, look, actually, we can try to get directly at these, uh, at these claims uh, to cash for different horizons by either kind of extracting from options or looking directly at derivatives like dividend strips or dividend futures that directly tell us uh, they directly give us exposure to these different cash flows. Okay, so this is the I I I would say a summary of what the literature is at. Uh, sorry, we're in the wrong direction. And so here's what what we do instead. What we do is uh, we kind of go back to the first approach, the first approach of actually just using equities. Uh, but we have the goal of writing instead of very simple model uh, that has kind of a qualitative prediction to actually enrich the model 
and so starts from an affine model, but an affine model has rich dynamics in it and, and looks at the large cross section of equities to really extract all the information that we can about the very complex dynamics that we see in reality of cash flows. In other words, in reality, cash flows don't follow very simple dynamics, they don't follow an AR1. Okay, and you have different types of cash. You have cash for different types of firms. You have cash for small firms, for big firms. So we're the goal of our paper is to write down and estimate an empirical affine model, okay, a reduced form affine model, uh, which should be rich enough to be able to price all assets jointly, and so to make kind of realistic predictions about how the you know this transactional discount rate should look like. But at the same time, we're going to try to impose discipline because otherwise this would be basically a, 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 a you know, an exercise with too much estimation error because you have too many parameters to estimate. So we're going to try to put some restriction. We're going to impose pricing restrictions. So we're going to impose an SDF and we're going to, you know, basically get, get cross equation restrictions. And we're going to impose some additional restrictions, basically that, that come from what we learned about, uh, about this cross section over the last few years. And so the outcome would be an affine model, which is very rich, but also constrained in some particular strategic ways that turns out to that we can use them to generate a structure of expected returns uh, for both the market and, and for 100 uh, diversified portfolios. So the idea is basically in spirit, very similar to a town vector, but in a much more richer, in, but in a much richer way uh, and, uh, and well disciplined by some theoretical restrictions. Okay. So how can we expand? How can you make the model richer while still maintaining some uh, some uh, uh, you know some parsimony, well, we can exploit some recent results that have been pointed out in the literature, and I'm gonna kind of tell you the results how, you know broadly now, and then later on we'll tell you exactly how they fit within our frame. Okay, so there's really two main results that we use to to motivate our, the, the, our choices. One is the fact that uh, you know now that we you know in the recent uh, decades we have discovered all these many many anomalies. We also discovered that we can sort, uh, if we can sort, of course, for uh, uh, stocks by many, many characteristics. So we can end up with a large cross section, not just on individual stocks, but a large, large cross section of sorted portfolios, which has an advantage compared to individual stocks that their betas are much more stable. Okay. And so, you know, we're going to work with models in which we don't want to think kind of explicitly about the time variation risk exposures instead of working with a large cross section of individual stocks. We can now work with a large cross section of sorted portfolios that have these two advantages. One is that they have stable betas, and two, they actually capture a variety of types of risk. Okay, so this, you know, we gain a lot of richness by looking at this, uh, this large cross section of portfolios. And in addition, one of the other things that has been come out in the recent literature is that once you look at this particular set of, of portfolios, actually a few PCs, a few principal components describe this co-movement and the cross-section uh, of returns very well. So it looks like even though we have a large set of portfolios, and we're going to consider 100 of them in this, in this paper, we actually can have a very good parsimonious representation with just a few factors. Okay, So that's point number one. We can going to be able to work with latent factors, with principal components. Uh, and second, there's a, a set, second set of results um, that says that in fact, you know, there is premium on these portfolios of these of these you know principal components are actually quite predictable, which tells us some which is gonna guide us in, in thinking about modern time variation expected returns. But at the same time, there's more because we are actually discovered that these principal components are predictable by the dividend price ratios basically of those PCs. So those PCs are just basically long short portfolios. And so the long short, you know, the, the difference in price dividend ratio of the long and the short size actually turns out to be a very good predictor of the expected returns of this portfolio. So the intuition from all these Campbell Schiller results that we have that you know the price dividend ratios on the market predict returns on the market, where they also be, we have kind of the analogous results for the uh, for the uh, returns of these PCs. Okay. And so this will allow us to get parsimony because we we can work directly uh, with these principal components. Okay. So uh, what is the goal? What is the output of our procedure? Well, first of all, after estimating all this, this model, what we're going to get is we can actually then get, you know, we have an SDF, we have the dynamics of the cash flows, we have dynamics of returns, we know everything we need to know. And so we'll be able to actually generate kind of implied dividend strip prices and dividend strip returns and expected returns and expected dividend growth and so on. 
So we can basically generate kind of synthetic dividend strips and we can ask ourselves how well do they match the actual price of dividend strips that we see in the data, which we have not used at all. We're not gonna be using at all in the estimation. And it turns out that, uh, that one of the central results that we have is that these uh, implied dividend strips actually match extremely well the actual price of the dividend strips that we see trading in financial markets, okay? And so that, I think that gives us some confidence that what we're doing here is actually able to capture, you know, the relevant dimensions of the term structure of these contracts. And in fact, I will also discuss later how if you instead don't use our approach, and you, you know, for example, you ignore these principal components, or you use, let's say, a Fama French five factor model instead of our principal components, you actually do a much worse job in matching this three, this three data. So the use of this entire large cross section is useful because it's just very informative about the richness of the dynamics of cash flows and returns. And so once we validate kind of our approach on this, in a sense, out of sample on this dividend strip data, then what can we do? We can do a lot of things. We can extend this term structure data back in time. So rather than being constrained to the time, to, you know, to the time period for which we actually do observe dividend strips, we can go back to the 70s. Why the 70s? Because you know, that's where we get all our uh, characteristics information. We can extend across maturities. Dividend strips are only available for a few years, maybe up to seven years or so. Uh, we can go, of course, once you have the entire term structure, we can go as far as we want uh, in time. So, you know, if you care about a climate change investment that has a hundred year horizon where we can, you know, we can use this procedure to think about the, uh, the right discount rate. And finally, we can say something across portfolios. Why? Because contrary to dividend streets where, you know, we're kind of constrained by the cash flows, the underlying cash flows on which these dividend strips are being written, uh, you know, once we, we have 100, uh, 100 different portfolios, for each of them, we can construct a particular term structure. So we can actually estimate what is the term structure for, of these countries for small stock cash flows versus for value stock cash flows. And we can ask ourselves, you know, do they look the same? Do they look different? Is there any interesting cross-sectional differences? Okay. And then we can use this to say something about theoretical models because models that are, for example, trying to explain the value premium they also have implication about how the value of the structure of this country should look like. And so, so this gives us additional uh, moment condition to test uh, our, our models. Okay, so I hope that it's clear uh, where I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just spend three minutes uh, kind of have, give you an overview of what we actually find. Um, and then I'm gonna stop to, to get a couple of, uh, to see if there's any questions. So, um, so first of all, um, one of the interesting things is that many, so, you know, many people at this point have studied this post and for sample, okay, of dividend strips. And they note a bunch of interesting things. For example, that during recessions, the third such of this country of the market is inverted, okay? Uh, or just to give you another pattern that the slow position structure of dividend strips actually predicts the future uh, realized uh, dividend growth. And, um, and uh, one of the things we do is we ask, you know, do these patterns actually extend to the long-term time series? So are these just spe something specific to the sample or not? And it turns out that basically all of them, they actually do extend to the 70s, okay? So for entire sample, we actually, you know, to that, the, the post and for sample doesn't look that different from the long-term average, okay? So for example, indeed, we have a bunch of previous recessions in which in almost all of them, the terms actually did invert, uh, indeed, expected dividend growth does vary substantially over time and is predicted by the, by, the, by the implied strips. And then finally, this result, which is kind of the original result of, of, of this very and coin, that, you know, that this kind of term structure of these countries for the agri was kind of too flat to be consistent with many of our models, like the long risk models, well, they stick to in our sample. It's not downward sloping, it's kind of flat, very close to flat. Uh, but is you know it's, in a sense it's statistically too flat to come out of those models, and now we have much more power to test that because now we have uh, uh, now we have you know um, 40, 50 years of data, and and finally uh, we have a lot of new cross-sectional results. These are truly new because on the original uh, assets we you know the original results of the previous papers were focusing on the on the uh, on the aggregate. So what are the cross-sectional results? There's a lot of interesting difference between, for example, value and growth stocks. Uh, value has strongly increasing term structure and growth has kind of a flat term structure. 
And it's kind of the opposite for small and large. Small stocks actually have a flatter structure of expected returns across horizons, whereas large stocks have tend to have an increase in terms of actual discomfort. Okay, so in this paper, we don't go further than this. We don't try to understand why that's the case. We present this as a model. And if you look at our websites, we present all these structure, which I think are going to be useful, uh, interesting uh, moments to evaluate uh, models against. And finally, I would like to mention there's also something interesting in the time series. So the slope of this structure is changing over time. And they don't change all together. You know, sometimes one inverts, the other does not invert. And I'm going to show you some a uh, couple of uh, interesting results. So bottom line is, I think this exercise provides some interesting new stylized facts that can be helpful to guide and evaluate uh, asset pricing models. OK, so I'm going to stop for one second and see if there's, uh, if there's any questions. OK, so a uh, simple question from Dimitri. It could wait, but since you stopped, I may as well ask it. Sure. Um, so this idea reminds me of the literature about how cash flow duration is priced in the cross section, e.g. Weber. How does it relate to your results? Fantastic question. So I've been thinking a lot about this. I actually discussed recently a paper uh, by Gorsan and Lazarus precise on the duration risk. So I actually I read carefully all these papers. So and, and actually, we actually now have a, a new section in the paper that exactly talks about duration. Okay. So let me just give you the bottom line. The bottom line is that when you're thinking about bonds, so let, let's go back to bonds. What does duration mean? It's very, very clear to interpret what duration actually means. Okay. Because really in bonds, you have what like you know, we have one major risk factor, which is that these persistent shocks to interest rates, and duration is very clear exposure to that. What we kind of want to emphasize in this paper is that, uh, is that indeed uh, we live in a very rich world in which there are many types of shocks to cash flows, many types of shocks to discount rates with different persistences, right? So it's really a very rich world. Duration, in, in a sense, is a very unidimensional uh, measure. And so, for example, when you, you think of a long duration of stocks where they're going to be exposed it is, you know, when you increase the duration, you're in a sense both increasing the exposure to these countries, but also increasing the exposure to a particular type of cash flow shocks, long-term shocks. So it's, it, I think that these results about the, the risk premium associated with durations are very interesting. What we're trying to paint in this, in this paper is a slightly more nuanced, uh, a nuanced picture in which actually, you know, just duration is so not sufficient to capture the entirety of, uh, of the kind of the richness that we have, because, you know, I mean, even get, just go back to Cambridge paper, right? You have exposure to cash flow shocks and exposure to discounter shocks. And so in a sense, duration will ca be captured in some combination of these risk exposures. But and I think it's, it's certainly interesting to look at duration, but I think it should be complemented by kind of disentangling of what really duration is capturing. Is it capturing long-term cash flow risk? Is it capturing long-term you know, discounter risk and so on? And I think that using our, 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 our estimates, you can actually try to, you know, which we have not done kind of in detail, but you could ask, try to understand where is the duration of risk premium coming from? Is it coming from exposure to longer tax flow, cash flows, a combination of long-term and, and cash flow and long-term discounter shocks and so on? Okay, so I think it's uh, it's one dimension of of a of a, of a richer world. All right, thank you. Thanks for the great question. Is there any more questions? Not right now. Okay, sounds good. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. Um, okay. So I'm going to uh, talk about the methodology. Now, I'm not going to go, given that we have, like, you know, we don't have infinite time, I'm going to go uh, kind of relatively briefly through the methodology, in part because really we are using the same machinery as all this very, very well developed uh, transstructural literature. So I'm going to really point out the main differences from the standard approach. Okay. So it's going to really be just two or three uh, pages with equations. So, first of all, we're going to allow, we're going to assume there's, a, there's an underlying state vector F. That is driving the dynamics of the economy. Okay, so just like in the standard literature, and we're assuming a um, a defined SDF. Here, we are going to assume everything is almost scedastic. So in this paper, we're going to ignore any type of sec time varying second moments. So any time variation in in in, in, in excess returns is going to be driven by um, in condition express excess returns is going to be driven by 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 by, by lambda t. Okay, by the price of risk changing. Um, okay, so but you know this the whole thing can be certainly extended to include uh, stochastic volatility. So this SDF is going to be a fine, and so UTs are the innovations, and these innovations are also uh, are the ones that are priced. Okay, and so these are basically pretty standard uh, setup for affine models. Now let's think about how we usually then uh, solve this kind of models. If you want to solve uh, for you know for bond, for bonds, it's easy because the, the SDF is all you need. 
you want to model you know, assets with risky cash flows, what do you need to do? You need to typically specify the dynamics of the cash flow. So you would have an equation that says here on the left-hand the left side, it says, you know, dividend growth is probably some, there's a predictable part, which is captured by FT, an unpredictable part, which is due to the FT plus one. So you basically typically model dividend growth as a linear, as a linear, you know, log linear in the factors of t, and then you apply your Euler equation, and you figure out what the returns look like. Okay, and typically at this point, because the equation linking returns to dividends to prices is nonlinear, right? Use the, the Campbell Schiller uh, identity, okay, or approximation. So here we're going to use a slightly different approach. So I'm going to let me tell you what we do, and then I tell you what is the difference here. Instead of starting by modeling dividends and then applying the Euler equation to it, we're going to start modeling. of t and which one is going to be non-linear but you will approximate as linear with respect to t okay so here what what are we doing here is rather than modeling dividend growth as linear we're, we're modeling price growth as linear which implies basically if you go to, through the algebra the dividend growth is actually non-linear function of t okay uh, it turns out that this has uh, several advantages one of the advantages is basically that rather than than obtaining a solution for YT, which is only true uh, within the approximation, the Campbell Shear approximation, the solution for YT is going to be exact. So basically, what we're doing is we're, we're pushing the linearity into dividend growth. But you know, to solve the entire model, we never actually have to apply the Campbell Shear decomposition. So think of it as a small kind of technical change. Uh, it just allows to basically never actually have to use the uh, the Campbell Shear decomposition. It has also one advantage that once you solve for dividend strips. The dividend stream is actually now being nonlinear function of FT, uh, but it has the advantage that actually the, the yields of the strips will actually perfectly sum up without any approximation to the aggregate, uh, aggregate yield. Okay, and so it, it, it just has like change. It's not a big conceptual difference, but it technically makes things very easy because we never have the problem of this kind of uh, uh, conflict between uh, the dividend strips, which uh, which are typically linear. And the and the aggregate, which is kind of a nonlinear function, which we approximate. We never have to deal with an approximation. Okay, so that's really the technical point. You know, the the the, the real content of this paper is really not really to set up this uh, this affine model, which is pretty standard, but it's rather in the choice of exactly how do we deal with this with this model, right? We have a hundred portfolios we're trying to match. You could really, you know, you could be really fancy and add like have a very very large of t, and you know the. The bigger you put, you make FT, and the more shocks you have, you, you're gonna get a more complex, uh, more complex uh, system that is gonna feed the data better. But how do we maintain parsimony in this very rich world? Well, here's what we do: we exploit these results that come from previous papers that say, look, you can actually focus on a few PCs, kind of like what the bond literature does, right? Where they say we're gonna work with a few factors, the RPCs of bonds. Well, this existing recent literature on, on equities tell us that we can actually summarize the cross section of equity returns or the panel, if you want, equity returns with a few PCs. So we're going to use focus on those PCs only. Okay, so our FT will be expressed directly as a function of things that involve these PCs. What are those things? Well, there are two things that you could think of, of, of putting into FT. Well, there are returns and yields. And our choice, and I, I'm going to argue why we make this choice, is to include both in FT. So our choice of FT will include four factors. So, the, so we are going to create four of these portfolios, which are principal components with loss short anomalies. And our F will have eight variables in it. And four of them are going to be the returns of these portfolios. And four of them are going to be the yields, so the price dividend ratios of this portfolio. OK? So um, what is the idea here? The idea is basically that you know, we're going to have something that captures the innovations, the returns, right? The returns are basically going to capture innovations. The returns are going to basically capture the UT plus one, okay? Uh, and then the YT, the, the dividend price ratios are there because there are these are the, our state values that contain for rook information. So they're really what contains the predictive power of this, of this component. So really, 
You see, in this equation one, you see there's really there are two pieces, of course. There's a predictable part and there's an innovation. The innovation is news about the future. And here we have basically state variables that are good at capturing either of these two. Returns are good at capturing news about the future, so innovations, what we didn't know before. And ye, the price dividend ratios are good at capturing, you know, kind of the, the, the forward-looking information we have at time t, sort of the predictable part. Now, in theory, right, so now we have an F that has eight state variables. So in theory, when you go back to this equation, the eight shocks could all be, so there's eight shocks, right, and there's eight state variables. So in theory, all eight shocks could be priced, and all eight state variables could be driving risk premium and the dynamics of future uh, factors. Here's where we are going to impose some restrictions. Okay, we're going to impose two restrictions. We really make the separation clear. First is only the shocks to returns, okay, are actually priced. So this UT is only the, you know the, the only UTs that actually matter are the ones on returns. So the innovation basically, what is the assumption here is that effectively we have an APT that holds. When you look at a space of returns, so the returns of these four portfolios completely span the space of returns, which are driven by the innovations. Okay, so this is kind of basically just saying that you know once you know the returns of the four portfolios, you you know all the price innovations in the SDF, and whatever else the innovation to the yields themselves don't don't contain any additional price factor. So they, basically, the, the returns are spanning the U. And the yields are spanning all the information we have about the future. So the lag returns don't matter. So to formalize this, basically, you see this is the matrix of that tells us which variables matter for risk premium. And you can see that the only thing that matters that is known zero is the past yield. So only the past yields, are only the yields, in a sense, are, are, are driving for looking risk premium. They are not driving. So the lag returns don't, don't actually uh, drive any risk premium. And vice versa, we have that the only thing that matters to predict the future, so the only thing that contains information about the future is the current yields and not the current returns. Okay, so that's the, the two the separation. The returns take care of the price shocks and the yields take care of the forward-looking information. Okay, these are not just to be clear, they're not just normalization restrictions. These are really economic restrictions. Okay. Okay. Let me stop for one second and see if the model setup is clear or if there's any questions. Uh, so there is a question from Mike Chernoff. So mm -hmm. uh, the question is, using returns and yields as states should apply a lot of cross equation restrictions on F. If I know dynamics of yields, I should be able to drive dynamics of returns. I think that's a question. No, because there are also the, the dividends involved in this. So it's not fully redundant, right? In a sense, it, it's, it's exactly the same. In a sense, this is, you can think of it as an extension of the, of the Campbell VAR, where you have price dividend ratios and returns, and in the background, you have dividends, which are kind of pinned down by that. And so it's really an extension of that, where in the VAR, you now have you know, all the returns and all the yields of many portfolios. But I agree with, with Mike that indeed, there are actually many, many cross-section restrictions and those are all imposed. I mean, I'm not going to go through the algebra now, but if you're, you know, uh, you know it, it's all spelled out in the paper, we actually do impose all these cross equation restrictions. So we take all of these equations seriously. So there's nothing that is, uh, uh, let's say, there's no, there's no component of this equation that we don't take the full implication about. There's more, any, any more questions? Uh, so, so I'll let you and Mike discuss that at the end, but uh, a clarifying question from Dimitri. Okay. To clarify, are dividends special here or can we write the same model for say price to book or price to EBIT as state variables? Um, well, you know, we they are special because in, in the background here, we have the Campbell-Schiller relation that relates uh, returns to prices to dividends. And so if you want to have instead some other stuff like accounting variables, then you need to have these other versions of the Campbell Sheet relation that, that you know, has ROAs and earnings and so on. So dividends are indeed special here. Any more, any more questions? Uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, okay. So these are basically four portfolios. So you have four PCs, so we have four portfolios. Everything is, is expressed in terms of these four portfolios. And then, uh, and then uh, we have, uh, of course, 
100 portfolios. So for all of them, we're going to make the usual assumption that these are uh, all uh, has some measurement error. So we avoid the stochastic singularity. And, uh, and that's all pretty stuff. OK. And so, OK, so that's a recap of the model. I don't think I, I need to spend a lot of time on this, but basically, we have a state vector. We have the PCs of anomaly returns and their price degree ratios. And, uh, and, uh, and we're going to uh, put the description that we just said. OK. So how do we estimate this? You know, we impose all their cost equation restrictions and we estimate everything via GMM. So a bunch of, you know, contemporaneous relationships with a bunch of like equations measured with error, with a bunch of equations that are time series relations. We put everything in a big GMM and we get the standard errors using, you know, the delta method. So, you know, everything is pretty standard. One thing I would like to point out is that working with dividends is a little bit tricky because uh, at high frequencies, they don't behave that well. And so we work here with yearly data uh, at the monthly frequency. So we basically will have overlapping yearly data. So we're going to adjust all our, uh, all our covariance matrices using the ansen Odric uh, standard errors. OK, but it, it, you know, there's nothing particularly special about the estimation. It's just a big, uh, comp you know, it's a big estimator. OK. So, uh, OK, so one of the interesting things I want to point out is, as I said, you know, because we're directly with this kind of modified yield and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and price growth, we never directly work with dividends. And it turns out that that means the dividends are going to be a nonlinear function of the state variables, which we can compute. And so that also means that, you know, many of our standard objects that we are care about in this paper, for example, dividends, strip prices, and equity yields, OK, which are these objects, OK? So this is the, 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 the fraction of the price of the aggregate coming from the end maturity strip. And this is the uh, equity yield, OK, which is the dividend price ratio of the strip, basically normalized by maturity. Well, those you can see they are kind of nonlinear versions of FT. OK, so basically we're kind of pushing all the nonlinear narratives into the strips at the advantage of making the actual aggregate linear, exactly linear without approximation. So, but we can compute them, right? Once we've also solved the model, we have all the dynamics, we can actually compute all of these. OK, so let me, I have, I think, 15 minutes or 17 minutes or so. So I would like to show you some results. Uh, so let me just tell you one more thing, which I I should have mentioned before. One is that you know we don't have anything about bonds here. Everything here is really in excess of bonds. Is using risk premia. Basically, just go to back here. You know we are. You know everything is being subtracting the risk free rate. Okay, so implicitly we are basically taking care of the of the bond term structure. But we are planning at some point to extend this to include both stocks and bonds in this big estimation. And then um and then you know the month the sample starts in uh, 74 and we are, we are updating now we've updated most of the results to 2020 so you are, you'll see be able, you'll be able to see some results on the some results on the on the pandemic okay the pandemic returns okay so here's some 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 data on uh, our estimation so these are our pcs so in the bottom graph you see the for so sorry let me, I, I forgot to say one thing which is actually useful Following this previous paper by Serhi, what we do is we don't have just four PCs of, this, of these anomalies. We have the market and then the first three PCs, OK? Because these are all long short. So they're, they're kind of netting out the market. So we have the market in these four PCs. So the, in, the bottom, uh, in the bottom graph here, what you have is you have basically a dividend price ratio of these, of these portfolios. And here you have the returns, OK? And what I wanted to point out, and to, to me the most interesting thing here, is that these PCs really seem to capture very different things. So for example, look at how persistent is, as we know, the dividend price ratio of the market. But look how different is the persistence of these other series, OK? So the first PC is you know, already less persistent. But look, for example, the green and the red lines, right? Those are really capturing shocks at very different frequency. There is something special also about this green PC, which is the second PC. It really seems to capture, to really kind of um, trigger during particularly bad downturns. Okay, so you know you can see that when there are recessions, it really kind of uh, it really kind of tanks, and, and and you see it in the financial crisis, you see in some of the previous recessions, and you see it also during the recent pandemic. Okay, but you see it, we are really capturing something which is a very different nature. And the fact that these dividend price ratios have different dynamics is very important, right? Because the entire point of this paper is to have a, a, a rich model for, for dynamics. Okay, so now how do we evaluate 
whether our model is doing well or not. Well, it's not that easy. So we're going to have two, uh, two exercises of, the, of this type. One of them is uh, that we're just trying to, to, so what we do is we, 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 we estimate the implied dividend strips for various maturities, and we compare with the prices of the ones that are actually traded. So here's, you see this figure looks a little bit stretched because we literally lifted it off of uh, Bansal's paper. But so, you know, they, they have, uh, you know, a, an updated sample of these dividend strips of maturities one to seven years, okay? And we, we you know, you, this is a picture that we produce using our data. And you can see that, you know, the, the, the dynamics actually look quite similar, okay? In particular, you see that there is this kind of big inversion. So the blue line is the short-term uh, short term strip and the, and, the, and the other ones are kind of longer, long maturities. You can see that first of all, the, you know, in general, the fluctuation look kind of similar to what these dividend strips that are traded actually look like. And in particular, you see this, this nice inversion during the financial crisis. Now, of course, for us, it's very easy uh, right now to just update it. Uh, to the current samples, you can see there was another big inversion precisely during the, the pandemic. But in fact, what's kind of interesting, this inversion actually started uh, started before the pandemic. Okay, so it just it was accelerated during the pandemic. Uh, now, maybe to, in a in a easier way to, to compare the two, here an overlap of the the actual dividend strip data in orange with the hour implied forward yields at the one year maturity on the top. And the slope, so the seven year minus the one year on the bottom. You can see that we actually match quite well both the level over this time period, but also the slope. Of course, it's not 100%, it's not perfect, okay? But I think we get, you know, we get actually uh, quite, uh, quite close. Now, you know, we do a bit of an exercise uh, in, uh, in the paper to try to understand, you know, how important it is that we actually have this rich, uh, rich dynamics and rich model. Well, here's what you would get if you instead use the CAPM only in the top. So what I mean like the CAPM, I mean literally a model where instead of having four portfolios, you just have the market and the and its president ratio. And here's if you have the five fan French factor plus momentum, you can see that you actually don't get any of that. First of all, you never get an inversion of the curve. And second, you know, the, 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 the time series, they actually look very different. Okay, so for example, this is the slope that you get from uh, the CAPM model, and this is the slope that you get from the fan French five factor model plus momentum. You can see that you really can't really match very well the dynamics with either model. So it's not actually just about having a large set of factors. You need to have a set of factors that contain differential information with the dynamics. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to capture uh, the, the, you know, to really well estimate well these, these term structures. And it turns out they found French five factors on their own. They actually don't have sufficient uh, dispersion or this difference in, in terms of dynamics. Okay. So we argue that you know, our, our, the, the use of this PC is actually uh, quite useful for this, for this object. And then I'm going to uh, start now telling you something more about the actual uh, results on the dividend strips. Okay. So here, uh, the first thing I want to show you uh, is basically how do our, uh, you know, now the average slope of the turn structure during different sample periods, how does it look like compared to what we know from previous, uh, from previous papers, okay? So this is a, a, an estimate of the real, basically the average forward risk premium, which really is very equivalent to what Bansan and co have done in the recent paper, which updates uh, Ralphs and, and Jules paper. And what you see is that, you know, first of all, we do find some areas of this curve, which is downward sloping, some of it is upward sloping. Uh, but you can see from this graph that indeed, com, com, you know, uh, in line with what Ralph and Jules had found, the turn structure of, of, of David and these countries in the US is actually pretty flat. And is in fact much flatter than what you would get out of the longer risk model. So I don't, I don't have the slides here, but if you do, uh, if you do uh, take the model and you simulate samples of this size of, you know, whatever it is, 15 years, and you ask, you know, how likely it is that I will get just by chance a transaction which is kind of so flat, you will actually very strongly reject the model. And indeed, you obtain the same uh, if you look at the longer sample. So in the longer sample, it goes back to the 70s, we actually do get a slightly more upward sloping transaction, but again, it's way flatter than what the models predict. And of course, if you have now much more data, right, uh, you can have much, much stronger statistical evidence against, against the model. So I think that overall, my view on this is that, uh, you know, we don't find a 
is, is strictly downward sloping infrastructure, but we find something which is sufficiently flat to basically they, they contains the same main message as Ralph's, uh, Ralph's papers. Okay, so here's another example of a result that was noted by Ralph and was already it was very strong in this original sample post 2004, and we show that it, in, it that holds you know uh, even more strongly if you extend back. Um, and what is that? That's the fact that these, div these equity yields, okay, these equity yields on these dividends triple different maturity, they actually turn out to predict very nicely dividend growth, which is surprising, right? Because we've been kind of, we've learned for many years that changes in the prices, they tend to line up with expected returns and not have a lot of predictive power for dividend uh, growth. But at short horizons, indeed, they seem to be, uh, be able to predict short term uh, dividend growth. And so there's this negative relation between expected, uh, between the equity yield and expected dividend growth. And you can see it from this graph, okay? This, the top again is the, just the, 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 the recent sample. And then, sorry, in the bottom, you see the longer sample and you see it's confirmed, okay? You, you know, when the green line is high, the orange line is low and vice versa. The blue line, which is the expected returns actually varies much less, okay? And you can see if you go back in time beyond the time for which we have this data, this, 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 these patterns are you know, very strongly confirmed, okay? So there are these massive movements in the equity yield that this is, for example, is for a five-year horizon. There are actually um, uh, there are a kind of uh, when you do the composition, they're attributed mostly to variation expected dividend growth. And so the longer sample again confirms some of these uh, these findings. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, a, another interesting uh, point I want to point out is that we can now think about how you know if we can go back in time. How did the variation in these equity yields look like at different maturities? Okay, so first of all, this is the sample again. Remember, there's this big inversion, it's typically upward sloping or slightly upward sloping, but it's this big inversion in the financial crisis. Well, what do we see in the longer sample? We see that in the pandemic, there was again this inversion, and even before the pandemic. And if you go back in time, you see you again find that you know when you have the MBR recessions, indeed, there is an inversion every time. Okay, and, you know, maybe except. Uh, you know, in the early 2000s, uh, where, this, where the research was still uh, kind of upward sloping, but except the case, you know, everywhere else, when there was a recession, you get an inversion. The other thing which is kind of interesting uh, is that you can see that the volatility of the slope and gender volatility of the yields is much more pronounced in the recent period. You know, I don't exactly know why, but you see that, you know, this, this research of this country seem to be much more stable uh, in, the early, in the early period. Okay, so another pattern let me just stop for one second to see if there's any questions because I, I think I, I ran out quite fast. Uh, yeah, so two questions um, from Mike Chernoff again. Can you infer actual dividends as opposed to their prices? Yes, we can. And they're nonlinear. And we do, I, you know, we, I have some results here and some results are in the paper, but yes, we can infer. It's just that the dividend, instead of being a linear function of the state variables, they are nonlinear function of the state variables. Yeah. Okay. And then from Stephen Ho, have you investigated implied dividends that are backed out from the put call parity relationship? So no, we have not done that. We can certainly do that. Yeah, yeah. No, for now we've only looked at the but 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 this. So are, are you saying as opposed to these the dividend uh, price of dividend strips? Or I guess maybe we can discuss this. Well, I'll time. let him. I'll let him follow right. up let, after, after you at yeah. the end. Yeah. So sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. All right, so then, then you know, let me just take the next uh, five minutes to, to, to conclude. Uh, I have the most interesting part is coming now. So, you know, let me take a few minutes to that. So one more thing I wanted to talk about is that uh, indeed you have, um, uh, you have the, uh, this very big difference between normal times of recession in terms of the average slope. And indeed we confirm that in normal time, this, this curve is basically flat and in a recession is downward slope. Okay, so now there's been a bit of a debate in the literature about whether this, this slope is actually upward sloping or downward sloping recessions, what we find is that if you define as M, the recession as MBR recessions, then you find a clear inversion. Uh, the, the, there is a question of which is the right variable to look at to define a recession. You can think of it you know, using the price linear ratio like Gormson did. You know, we have not investigated this in detail, but at least what we find is that during recessions, we have a downward sloping curve. And finally, I want to point out that really, the, you know, the, I would say the biggest advantage beyond be able to expand these or existing results back in time and kind of confirm them, we generate 
turns out this country is on a bunch of turns of, of different uh, assets. Okay, and so here are a bunch of different uh, examples. Uh, this is a time series, okay, of the slope of the yield curve for uh, small stocks in blue in the top graph and, and, and large stocks in red, okay? And what you see here is that the slopes of the term structure, they don't move all at the same time in the same direction. They kind of move in different ways. And for example, it, interestingly, during the, the tech boom in the 90s, you actually see that the term structure of, uh, of, of, of small stock inverted, okay? And whereas the term structure of large stocks did not invert. So there's some interesting uh, variation uh, between short, between small and big stocks. If you look at the bottom graph here, the blue line is value and the, and the red line is growth. And you must see much less of this difference, which is kind of surprising right? because you would think that during the tech boom, there'll be like probably the biggest difference will be between this, the term structure of value and, and growth, but it's actually not the case. The biggest difference is between uh, small and large stocks. And then finally, there's also inter some interesting results about the average term structure of these countries for small and large stocks and for value and growth. So the top one is for small stocks, the bottom is for large stocks. You can see is small stocks are kind of flat, the term structure of these countries, and large stocks is kind of upward sloping. Whereas when you look at growth and value, it's value that is upward sloping and growth that is kind of flat. And so when you then look, you know, in a sense, you look at the slope for SMB and HMA, you find very different results. SMB seems to be kind of more exposed to the short-term risk and they have kind of a higher risk premium for short-term cash flows. And HML has this kind of a U-shape, uh, which is uh, potentially more exposed to the long-term than the short-term uh, shocks, okay? Or at least the risk premium are higher in the long-term than the short-term. So it, it paints, I would say, overall, a pretty uh, uh, rich picture of these different term structure. And the hope for this paper would be that uh, if you, you know, if one has a model about, let's say, the value premium or the small firm premium, and has you know an explanation of you know what kind of risk it's it's affected by, and uh, you know what could should be able to easily compute the transaction of these countries in the model and compare it to the data. And there's going to be apparently, uh, as the evidence shows us, a, a pretty big difference between whether you're gonna uh, whether you know for example between small stocks and value stocks. Uh, and you know. Of course, with 100 portfolio. So for each of these 100 portfolio, you can repeat the exercise and you can check what's going on. I'm just going to give you an example. Uh, this is a sample of very high level stock. It's a, it basically, it's a portfolio sold by leverage. Okay, and what you see, you see that the equity yield during the financial crisis, in particular, really kind of massively tanked. Uh, so the price tanked, right? So the equity yield went up, and then it kind of collapsed uh, after the after the the financial crisis. And indeed, what you see here from the uh, from this blue line is that this is um, this is the uh, the exp so the reason why this equity yield was going up so much is people were expecting very negative dividend growth over the financial crisis. And indeed, if you look at the orange line, which is that then they realized dividend growth. Indeed, dividend growth followed this very strongly, and so. This I think goes back a bit to Mike's question from before. Can we get dividend growth process from, from implied dividend growth process from our estimation? Indeed we do. And this E of G is indeed the expected dividend growth. So it's not the realized dividend growth, it's expected dividend growth. And this orange line is their you know, ex post realized dividend growth. And you see that indeed they line up pretty well. So indeed this predictability we get implied from our model actually does then, you know, the is actually then uh, represent, well represented in the ex post uh, dividend growth. Okay, so last thing I want to talk about, then I'm going to conclude. Uh, you know, what we, we are trying to, you know, one of the words we have is that maybe we're, we're doing things with many parameters, we'll do a lot of very nice in sample fitting, but out of sample things don't work very well. So what I want to compare here is the following. So the top is the same results I showed you before, is the in sample fit of the dividend strips in the 2004 plus sample using our full sample estimator. In the bottom, what do we do? We use data up 2004 to estimate the model. And then, based on those parameter estimates, the, the bottom line, the bottom panel is doing out of sample. So from 2004 onward, is generating these implied dividend strips, and, and we can then compare, you know, with the uh, ones, uh, you know, with the ones that are were actually traded. You can see that almost nothing changes. So these parameter estimates, they are obtained before 2004. They still do a very good job in matching dividend strips uh, uh, out of sample. 
Okay, so that's the end. Uh, we propose a new method or, you know, a, or new implementation of, of a rich transaction model, a fine model to estimate the price dynamics and the transaction risk premium. There's a bunch of new stylized files we propose. We hope this, this can be useful both to value new investments, but also to test the predictions of asset pricing model, which very often are not just about the, the, the term structure, but of aggregate dividends, but also about the time structure of different uh, types of portfolios. And I'm going to close it. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Um, there was there's one outstanding question, but before I ask it, I will I'll just tell everyone else that now's the time where you're welcome to unmute yourself and use your microphone and shout out your questions like in a regular like in a face to face seminar. Um, so feel free to do that while you're thinking about your questions. I'll just ask the one outstanding question from Francois Cocoma. Um, as I remember, only 50% of S&P 500 stocks pay dividends. How are non-dividend paying stocks treated in your analysis? Okay, so that's a great question. So remember that we are not working directly with individual stocks. What we do is we work with sort of portfolios. So if within the, so for every characteristic, we have 100 characteristics. For every characteristic, we build three beans. Uh, and we, you know, our 100 portfolios are for each characteristic, the top bean and the, and the bottom bean. So within those, there are some going to be non-paying, uh, but at least some of them will be paying. Now, one thing, and uh, now I shared my slides, unfortunately, but if you remember, we never work with the log dividend price ratio directly. We always work with the log of one plus dividend price ratio. So even if in the extreme case where there are some zeros, which because all the stocks in the portfolio that give you zero is, you know, everything go, is fine, mathematically speaking, but that doesn't really happen because we are always working in portfolios. So yes, some stocks will not pay dividends, but the others will. All right. Um, thanks. So are there other questions? Now's your chance. Now's your chance to tell Stefano he's wrong. Now's your chance to ask whatever question you want. I have, I have a Bye. question. Yeah. So hi, Stefano. Hi, everybody. So it's an interesting paper. So I, like, I think, I mean, I, I plan to read it, but I didn't get the chance. So I kind of tune in. So I think the main strength of your approach Right, it's not this that, that you have this analytical formula because I think Campbell Schiller, it's approximation, but it's pretty accurate. I think the main strength of your approach is that you're avoiding modeling dividends because this is kind of messy, right? Because it's like buy, buybacks, whatever else, like who knows what dividends are. So I think that's kind of the main strength of your approach. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, having said this, it's nice to kind of have, and that's why I asked my question, it's nice to have a sort of a reality check afterwards. Once you infer your dividends from your model, do they, do they relate to anything that kind of resembles what we see in the data, even if the data kind of, we can acknowledge that the data are messy? Okay, so you're, you're completely right in the sense, so we, we, we don't report much about that, but they, we, we, we have some, you know, I don't have in the presentation, but we have something in the paper that relates the, at least the expected dividends to the realized dividend. We do a lot of checks on that type. So the implied expected dividends, they do look like the dividends, but I, we should just probably just have a plot of the, of the, but remember the following, right? The, the, the basically for, so maybe, so the implied dividends are actually very close to the dividends. The reason for that is that this factor model was on those 100 portfolios, okay? It holds very tightly. So we're, you know, we basically fit for those 100 portfolios, we fit the yields very well, right? It's basically just little measurement there if you want. And we fit the returns very well and both are part of our state variables. So we have to match dividend pretty well. But you know, there's you know, this is not 100% exact, right? Because there's measurement error. So you know, we should definitely report more on this. But broad, broadly, we, we match returns and we match dividends, so we have to match dividends. So okay, you, yeah, I, had match, another, yeah. I had another clarifying question. So, yeah. right, so you kind of you were trying to convince us that basically the evidence for S and P 500 curve is basically it's flat, right? And and you're saying it's powerful because the models imply strongly otherwise. Yeah. But then it seems like if you look at sort of your part of your cross-sectional results, we're comparing large versus small or value versus growth, the magnitudes are kind of comparable. So if you view the S&P curve flat, I would say that the other curves are flat as well. But okay, again, so that's but a good you, point. I, I guess the flat, yeah, no, 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 I, I, I get the point. I mean, I think I, I, I would say that flatness is, is maybe a little bit in the eye of the holder in the sense that you, you know, it's kind of, hard to say what is flat or what's not flat. I think we need models for that. 
And so for the aggregate, I can use, you know, what I did, and I, we have a section in the paper that's that we take the, you know, the Bassa Kiko and Yaron or the Bassa a bunch of models, right? We simulate them and we can say, statistically speaking, it's too flat or not. For the rest, I have not done the exercise, okay? So, you know, you're right. It might be that they are all basically flat and that's interesting per se, but I think we need a model to guide us on deciding whether that's too flat or not. Those are great questions, thank you. Okay, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, hi, very interesting approach and I didn't get to, to read the paper in full. So feel free to tell me that this concern is invalid. So as I see it, your main object is, is the term structure and, and chances are that the SDF you're writing down is not super well, not perfectly specified. So that's not per se a problem unless this SDF then picks up, up some features in the beta that gives us wrong conclusion about your object. Now, is there some way to check whether this is this concern is invalid? Like, could you do a simulation study, for example? I mean, I, I would say that, you know, so, okay. So every SDF is wrong, right? Every model in a sense is wrong. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a question of, of figuring out whether the, the wrong model we use is useful for something. And I think that the most natural way to check if it's useful is to see if it passes the cross section, right? Because if the SDF is, you know, oh, but of course it does not do a perfect job in process cross section. So is that job good enough? So I can tell you what we get. These results is here from this paper, is here in my other papers where I also use PCs in here, there is service paper. So, you know, you get an R square about 50%, like a cross section R square on this very large set of anomalies. Now, whether it's good or bad, you know, uh, who, who knows, right? I mean, of course, ideally we'll get 100%. Exposed, of course, you get 100% with the exposed SDF, you know. Uh, is that is that good enough that I don't know? Uh, but you know, to, to give another example, if you just try to price the 25 fine French portfolios, you get about 75% R square cross section R square. So you know, I don't think we're very far off given we're trying to explain 100 different or you know 50 different anomalies. Uh, but I would say that would be the way to check. Uh, the other way to check is to say, you know, are we doing a good job in matching the strips? And I think from that point of view, we're doing a good job. But I think you have a follow-up. Um yeah, but just 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 a quick follow-up. Yeah. Um... I get the point of matching the cross section for terms, but it's unclear how much of the implied term structure of, of, of this conrad you have to match to match the cross section for terms, right? The mapping is completely unclear because this is all not observed. So right. No, it's a good question. I am I, 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 I don't I don't think I have a great answer to that, except that probably the best thing you can do is to try to match to find some additional out of sample stuff that you haven't used in your estimation to match it, I guess. So for example, we could think about using individual stocks. Which we have not done yet because the quality of the DNS strip data is not so good. Uh, but yeah, but that I think would be the way to go. More questions? Last chance.